as Cody said, my name is Chip, and I'm one of the deacons here. <laughs> so, uh, of course, Jeremy was at camp this week, and a few weeks ago he asked me if if I uh, would be interested in preaching, and and so I said, well, sure, whatever, whatever you need me to do. And so, of course, we're in the book of Psalms this summer, the summer in the Psalms. And he said, well, just pick one out and then you, know, you can just preach from that. Well, that's a big task. You know, there's 150 Psalms. I was like, what in the world? Where do I go to, to do that? So I was thinking about and praying about, you know, looking through the Psalms, reading through them. And so I came across Psalm 51 and then uh, Jeremy shared, you know, what psalms he was going to be preaching out of for the, for the rest of the summer, or at least for some of the ones in the future. And then I saw that he had Psalm 32 on the docket. Well, that was last week. And so I don't know if you're familiar with Psalm 51 and Psalm 32, but they covered the same thing. And so I was like, oh, man. So what do I do from, from here? So, but after talking a little bit about it, I don't know, we kind of decided on this. That I'm, I'm going to stick with Psalm 51 because, you know, when you're reading the Bible, when you see things that are repeated fairly close to one another, well, what does that mean? It means it's pretty important that God's trying to get our attention and says, hey, I, I need you to look at this and pay attention to this because I need you to get it. And so... That's what we're going to do. So Psalm 32 and Psalm 51, it covers a lot of the same ground. Uh, but, you know, some of the things I'll be talking about this week will be a little bit different than what Jeremy shared with us last week. So if you would uh, bow with me and ask God to bless our time in the study of his word today. Father, we thank you for this day you've given to us to come together. And, and Father, I echo the words of, of Andy when he prayed a while ago. Thank you that we live in a country that we, that we do where we can come and freely worship you and read and study your word, Father. And we just ask that you would bless our time as we do open the Bible and, and study your word. And Father, I just would, I just pray that you would prepare our hearts and our minds and uh, just bless the words that come from me. And I just pray that they would be your words, Lord. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay. So Psalm 51 written by King David. And so in this Psalm, it is covering where, uh, David had committed adultery with Bathsheba. And so Jeremy covered that very, very well last week, what, what led up to this. And so Psalm 51, if you look at the, you know, in the very opening there, it says to the choir master, a Psalm of David, when Nathan the prophet went to him. So now, of course, David committed adultery and then he had, he had Uriah come back and then had Uriah killed. So David's committed adultery, he's committed murder. And then Bible scholars believe that Nathan the prophet came to David. It wasn't instantaneous. It was about a year. So a year has gone by. Bathsheba is, is, is pregnant at this time. The child has more than likely been born. So I know when, you know, for me anyway, I thought, okay, David committed adultery. He had Uriah killed. Nathan showed up. And these events all happened pretty quick to one another. It didn't happen like that, though. We're, we're talking about a year had went by. And David must have thought, you know what? I've done pretty good covering this up. Uh, you know, the child's been born, nothing's happened, so I'm all right. But obviously he had to be living with a lot of guilt. So let, let's look at what Nathan had to say to David to kind of understand the context of what's going on before David penned the words of Psalm 51. So this part I'm going to re be reading from 2 Samuel chapter 12, verses 1 through 13. And so it says this, And the Lord sent Nathan to David. He came to him and said to him, There were two men 
in a certain city, the one rich and the other poor. The rich man had very many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing but one little ewe lamb, which he had bought. And he brought it up, and it grew up with him and with his children. It used to eat of his morsel and drink from his cup and lie in his arms, and it was like a daughter to him. Now there came a traveler to the rich man, and he was unwilling to take one of his own flock or herd to prepare for the guest who had come to him. But he took the poor man's lamb and prepared it for the man who had come to him. Then David's anger was greatly kindled against the man, and he said to Nathan, As the Lord lives, the man who has done this deserves to die. And he shall restore the lamb fourfold because he did this thing and because he had no pity. Nathan said to David, You are the man. Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, I anointed you king over Israel, and I delivered you out of the hand of Saul, and I gave you your master's house and your master's wives into your arms, and I gave you the house of Israel, of Judah. And if this were too little, I would have added to you as much more. Why have you despised the word of the Lord to do what is evil in his sight? You have struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword and have taken his wife to be your wife and have killed him with the sword of the Ammonites. Now, therefore, the sword shall never depart from your house because you have despised me and have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. Thus says the Lord, Behold, I will raise up evil against you out of your own house. And I will take your wives in the sight of this son. For you did it secretly. But I will do this thing before all Israel and before the son. David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said to David, The Lord also has put away your sin. You shall not die. Pretty powerful words from from Nathan, and, um, and I do think it's important that we understand David's and at this time in his life. You know what he's thinking, what he might be going through. So you know, leading up to the events of before he committed adultery with Bathsheba, you know, things were going really good for David. He had success in everything he did. Uh, you know, even from uh, a youth, you know, of course he defeated Goliath when nobody else had faith in God. David did. He defeated Goliath. You know, when, when he went out into battle, he was victorious. You know, there were songs sung about David and the greatness of, uh, of him as a, as a warrior. You know, in everything he did, he honored God and he tried to do what God wanted him to do. Even when Saul was trying to kill him, he didn't want anybody to lay a hand on Saul because he knew that even though Saul was trying to kill him, Saul was the Lord's anointed. And he respected what God had to say. But I guess, you know, when things go good for us, we can kind of sort to give ourselves credit and kind of go into Cadillac gear and take it easy. And it could get, we could get to a point where we could forget about God. You know, I, yeah, I'm, I'm doing pretty good. It's because of me that I have this. It's because of my hard work that I've got this or I've got that. And, boy, I've, I've got uh, the attention of a lot of people right now. And if we're not careful, God and the, thing, the words of God can go into the back of our minds. And before we know it, maybe not even be there. Because David had some chinks in the armor that led up to the events of Bathsheba. You see, things were going good for David, but here's one thing that we see in 2 Samuel 5.13. It says this, And David 
took more concubines and wives from Jerusalem after he came from Hebron, and more sons and daughters were born to David. Now we might look over that verse and think, well, well yeah, David had lots of wives. You know, many, you know, more than one. You know, if you go more than one, that's not a good thing. So, you know, David should have stuck probably with, with one wife. That's the way to go right there. But he took on more concubines and wives. But, you know, this is in direct violation of Deuteronomy 17.17. 17. And so there's several verses there talking about some rules for the king, future kings of Israel. Even though there was no king at that time, uh, God in His wisdom and sovereignty knew there was going to be a king. And we read this in Deuteronomy 17.17. 17. Speaking of the, Israel's future kings, And he shall not acquire many wives for himself, lest his heart turn away. Well, David did that. So he's starting to be in violation of what God wanted him to do. Uh, last week, Jeremy talked about it was springtime. And what are kings supposed to do in the spring? Go out to war. Thank you. Thank you for that response out there. Somebody's listening. Thank you, Neil. Uh, kings are supposed to go out to war at that time. Did David go out to war? No. Neglecting his responsibilities that God had called him to. And instead of being out at war, being busy, instead of doing what God had called him to do, he raised him to be king. Uh, God had raised David to be king to clear the land uh, so that the Israelites, the, the followers of God, could have peace in Israel. But David didn't do that. Instead, he wandered out on the balcony, saw Bathsheba, and well, the, the rest is history. So, you know, about a year goes by, and David's thinking, all right, uh, I've successfully hidden all this from everyone, and probably even including God, because God obviously was not much in his mind as he committed these uh, acts. But then Nathan showed up, and boy, did he ever show up. And so look, we're going to read through Psalm 51 right now. And so let's look at how David responded to uh, his sin after being confronted about it. And so I think in Psalm 51, this shows us a, a good model for true repentance of our sin. And so if you want to follow along on the screen or if you have your Bible, you can open that up to Psalm 51. And here we go. Psalm 51, to the choir master. A psalm of David when Nathan the prophet went to him after he had gone into Bathsheba. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, you delight in truth in the inward being, and you teach me wisdom in the secret heart. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me with a willing spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners will return to you. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God, O God of my salvation, and my tongue will sing aloud of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth will declare your praise, for you will not delight in sacrifice, or I would give it. You will not be pleased with the burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. 
Do good to Zion in your good pleasure. Build up the walls of Jerusalem. Then you will delight in right sacrifices, in burnt offerings, in whole burnt offerings. Then bulls will be offered on your altar. So the Bible doesn't sugarcoat anything, does it? When we look at the life of David, we get some pretty intimate details about all the goings on in his life. So, you know, we get to read about all of his triumphs and conquests, but also the, the adultery, the, the acts of murder. So just think for a second, how would you like it if your life were to be presented in a book you know, for all to read, and particularly for all to, to learn from. That would be pretty scary, wouldn't it? Uh, but that's, that's fortunately what we have with David. Uh, man, you know, if, if our life were to be presented like this, can you imagine the, at least for me, you know, the embarrassment, the, you know, the, the shame? I never want my face to be seen around here again if people were to know, you know, the innermost secrets that we all have. You know, but that's what we have here in, uh, in the Word of God with, with David. And praise God that we do have this to study because, uh, you know, what, what's David known as? You know, when we're talking about King David, there's one phrase that always comes to my mind that's David, that David is known as. What, what's that? What do you think? He's a man after God's own heart. Even though all this, we read about this in the Bible. What's he known? A man after God's own heart. So how could he still be known as a man after God's own heart and to commit adultery, to commit murder? Well, let's, let's take a look and see at, uh, at how he responded. And I've got three things. If you've got on your notes, it's blank. So you can write down one, two, three, and we will fill that in as we go along today. Uh, but see, with the story of David, we see that forgiveness is available for everyone. No matter what you have done, forgiveness is available to you. No matter what you say, well, God can never forgive. Yes, he can. Yes, he can. Listen and learn. Because, you know, I, I dare say, anybody committed murder in here? Probably not. You probably wouldn't be sitting in here right now if, if that were the case. Uh, but you know, if there's... If there's enough grace, love, and mercy for a murderer to be forgiven, you can be forgiven and you can experience the same forgiveness that, that David did. So what, what happened here? The, the first thing is David was broken. David was broken. Uh, you know, the first, the first words of this psalm in, in verse 1 is, Have mercy on me, O God. Have mercy on me. So, you know, when do you say, have mercy on me? Yeah, it's when things are at the point where you can't take it anymore. I remember as a kid, and we'd play the, the game of mercy. You'd lock hands like that, and you'd try to bend somebody's wrist back. Did y'all play that game? And we, we played that, and we called that mercy. And so when your wrist would get back so far, it would start hurting. you say, mercy, and the kid would let go. And you'd be free of that pain because you wouldn't have that pressure being applied right there. Well, God used Nathan to apply the pressure to David to get him to that point to where he was broken. And... Uh, just think what Nathan had to, how he had to feel going into that. You know, Nathan had David, he had a good story for him. You know, Nathan was wise how he went to David and tell him the story of a rich guy and a poor guy, and he took the poor guy's lamb. You know, he got David emotionally involved in the story. You know, David's anger got risen up in him. It's like, this shouldn't happen to this guy. That's wrong what happened. And yes, it was wrong. And then Nathan said he used four three-letter words that shook David to his core. You are the man. 
You are the man. And then everything that David thought that he had hidden from everybody, even from God, came rushing right to the front of his mind. And at that, at that point, he knew that this is wrong. I, I, I've been living a life that I shouldn't have. I've covered this up and I should not have. And he was absolutely broken at this time. And he'd been in denial for a long time. Uh, you know, the child that he had fathered with Bathsheba, you know, the kid had been around for, for a few months at this time. You know, David, he felt pretty secure that he had successfully covered things up. And, uh, you know, we, can, we might think that we're, we can fool people or even fool God, but that's not the case at all. You know, and, and sometimes even when we're caught red-handed doing things, we still don't want to uh, admit it sometimes. My, uh, my first year of teaching at Ohio County High School, was, the kids had gone home. Well, most of them had gone home at that time. And so I was in my classroom, and I was doing something. And the boys' bathroom was right outside on the other side of the hallway from my door. And I, I could smell something. It's like somebody's smoking in the, smoking in the boys' room. So, uh, so I wander out in my classroom, and I... I wandered go in the bathroom and there's three boys in there and there's one boy in in the stall and he had the the cigarette in hand like this and then he's talking to his buddies and he turns and we make eye contact and the, so the toilet's right here and he goes Psh! and then he throws the cigarette in the toilet while maintaining eye contact with me and I say all right let's go down the office and he says what? I said, what do you mean, what? You, you're smoking in here. And he says, no, I wasn't. I said, dude, I just watched you throw the cigarette in the toilet. Of course you were smoking in there. I didn't do that. I wasn't smoking in there. And, you know, and just like I caught that kid red-handed, I watched him do all this, and he bold-faced lied to me. But, folks... It's easy for us to do that, you know, to deny in our inward self, you know, what's really going on in our life. And um, and sometimes when you may be confronted, and it might be somebody uh, close to you, it might be a, a family member that might confront you about a sin or you might just feel the conviction of the Holy Spirit calling to you, maybe even today. And, you know, the question is, how, how are you going to respond to that when you're, when you're called out? You know, when you are aware of some sin that is going on in your life, and you finally come to that point to where you know, I, I need to confess this before God. Uh, Make sure that you follow through with that. You see, and so David, David got to the point to where he was broken. You know, and sometimes you know when we get broken, it can happen through circumstances that are not of your own doing. At times, you know, when you get that phone call about the test results that come back from the doctor, and the diagnosis is not good, or that. You get that phone call that a loved one has been in a, in a car wreck. And something's happened to somebody very close to you. That, that's, you didn't do anything there. And, you know, in, in life, life just happens sometimes, you know. And we can, we can be broken at that point. Or we can do things of our own doing. And there are consequences of our sin It happens, you know. With, with David, uh, when we look at when we look at David, when he committed his, you know, the sin with Bathsheba. Look at the people that were affected there, and so Uriah lost his life. You no, know, his family was forever changed. The sword did not depart from David's kingdom. And he experienced a lot of heartache after that. 
But, uh, but you see, God is trying to get us to the point where we turn to Him, and He wants you to cast your burdens and all your cares at His feet. Don't try to carry it anymore. He's trying to get your attention to let you know that I sent Jesus to do that for you. Cast those cares upon Him. Confess your sins. See, the Bible is also clear. It says, Blessed uh, are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. You know, and so we need to mourn over our sin, and God will take, take it from there. And so you know, the second thing that we see that David did is he, he confessed his sins. So he was made aware of his sins. He was broken. And then he confessed his sins. And so th this is part of repenting. You know, to repent of your sins means to admit and then to, to turn away as not to do them again. He took ownership of his sins. And so we can read there, particularly in verses uh, 2 through 5, uh, David saying, Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you and you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me. And a lot of these same words that we heard last week from Jeremy as he preached, you know, sin, iniquity, transgression. And so here they are again. You know, David is not denying it anymore. He is confessing his sin. And so that's part of it. You know, whatever sin you are confessing, name it to God. You know, here I'm sure David was saying adultery, murder. Uh, I've been lying to you, God. And I have sinned against you. And so be sure to name them. Be sure to name them. This is a huge part of repentance. And for true repentance to take place, this must happen. Uh, and, and with David, and even we read this in 2 Samuel, with David, and I think one of the big things, and I, and I believe this is one of the reasons why I, I feel that God has led us to go into Psalm 32 and, and now Psalm 51 this week, is because of secret sin. I think that secret sin that, that folks have is a huge reason why... Lives aren't the way they're supposed to be. Why our country is not the way it's supposed to be. Uh, folks, secret sin is not really secret. You know, just like David thought, I've covered this up, and even he called it a you know, secret. It's not a secret. See, we do, our sin is only against God, but secret sin always affects those close to you. Secret sin always affects those close to you. You know, David, like I said a while ago, in this instance, he lost the, the child that was born to Bathsheba. Uh, Absalom made his life miserable. You know, David had to spend the first part of his uh, reign fleeing from Saul. Things were good for a while. And then uh, he had to flee for his life again because his own son was trying to take the throne from him. And we see so many instances of, you know, of secret sin in, in the Bible. In our, uh, in our D group a few weeks ago, uh, we were in Joshua. And so we read about the, uh, the victory there at, at Jericho. And so the, the Israelites have moved into the, the promised land, and they, they had a successful uh, battle at Jericho, they marched around the city, they shout, the walls fall down. You know, just a spectacular battle. And you know how many people, uh, how many Israelite soldiers died in that battle? None. None. You know, that's pretty spectacular when you think about it. You know, to go into war, to go into battle, and nobody dies, at least on their side. And so, but one of the things that God had said is, you know, do not take any anything from that, you know, for it, it is sacred to the Lord. Do not take anything. However, there was a man named Achan, and so 
what we see that Achan did is he, he took a, a cloak. He saw this robe, this cloak that looked pretty cool in his eyes. So he, he took that. He saw some silver. And so he took some silver and he took a, a bar of gold. All in direct violation of what God had to say. So l listen to the, to the words that, that Achan said uh, when confronted about that. And so you see in Joshua knew something had gone on because they went to the next battle where they are supposed to take the city of Ai. Now you smell that? A-I. So if you, uh, if you read through this in, in Joshua chapter 7, they're like, okay, what happened here? And so by casting of lots, they figured out, okay, this, this is Achan. And so Joshua said, Achan, what happened? What did you do? And Achan answered Joshua. This is in uh, Joshua 7, and I'm reading, reading here in, in verse 20. And Achan answered Joshua, Truly I have sinned against the Lord God of Israel. And this is what I did. Now, now listen carefully, because this is secret sin wrapped up in a nutshell right here. When I saw among the spoil a beautiful cloak from Shinar and 200 shekels of silver and a bar of gold weighing 50 shekels, then I coveted them and took them. Then I co then uh, and see they are hidden in the earth inside my tent and with the silver underneath. So the things that I underlined there was uh, I saw and then coveted and then took them and then he hid them. And so I don't know if you know the rest of the story there. Can you guess what happened to Achan? He was killed. You know who else was killed? His family. His whole faith. Achan's secret sin resulted in the death, not only in the death of his family, but there was 36 Israelite soldiers that were killed because somebody was in violation of the commandments of the Lord. And he's like, well, why, why was Achan's family killed? They didn't take the cloak and the silver and the gold. Well, they knew about it. And they help cover that up. And yeah, that's pretty severe punishment. But you see, when we have secret sin in our life, th think about the, the harm that goes on. You know, I just think about, you know, kids at, at school in particular where a dad has left the family, you know, and or a mom has, has run off. You know, we can see where the kids suffer. In that, and that's just what we see at school. There's no telling. We know what it feels like at home, or you know, when there's you know some other secret addiction, you know, that's going on. You know, whether that be with alcohol or drugs, pornography, you name it. You know, whenever there is secret sin, there are more people than you realize that realize what's going on. They they know what's going on, and and it's something that we even think that we're hiding it from God. David thought he was hiding it from God, but folks, you know, God knows our thoughts. Uh, a few weeks ago, we were um, we were reading in, in Luke, and there's the the story of um, of Jesus, and he was at is on the Sabbath, and so they were in the in the temple and there was a man with a withered hand in the temple and so there's some scribes and Pharisees in there and the Bible says this about Jesus because the scribes and the Pharisees they were trying to catch Jesus you know and trying to figure out a way how can we get this guy we we want to kill him and the Bible says this and Jesus perceived their thoughts Jesus was reading their mind. He knows, God knows what we're thinking. And so Jesus knowing that he, you know, they're wanting to set him up. They're, you know, looking for something. And so he, he gives them a little something. He says, is it, is it, uh, on the Sabbath, is it better to do right or to do wrong? On the Sabbath, is it right to, uh, to heal or to, to kill? And you know what the scribes and the Pharisees, they were confronted with their sin right there. You know what they did? 
They didn't say a word. And so Jesus, knowing that, looked at him, and then he looked at the man with the weathered hand, and he said, stretch out your hand, and he healed the man. His hand that was bent and crippled became whole just like that. And so God always knows, you know. And so, you know, Jesus confronted those men about, you know, some sin in their life right there. They chose to be quiet. They chose to continue the denial. David was broken, and he confessed his sin. Now, let, let's be like David. Let, let, let's confess what's going on. And the, the third thing that, that David did, he asked God to restore, to forgive, and to change him. You know, he asked God to save him. So David asked God to restore, forgive, and change him. So he is now fully repented of his sin. You know, remember, you know, to repent means to, to turn away from, to confess, and to not go back. You know, and we listen to these words that, that David penned here. Purge me with hyssop. You're like, well, what's hyssop? You know, hyssop was like a, a leaf that priests would use to either, one, pour water on somebody who was, you know, unclean, or even uh, when sacrifices were offered, and animals were, were slaughtered, what comes out of the animals? Blood does. And so they would put blood on this hyssop and pour blood over the people sometimes. And that's kind of gross. Well, the, uh, the Bible is clear that even the Old Testament said, without the shedding of blood, there cannot be forgiveness of sin. So we kind of have some... Uh, foreshadowing of Jesus and the blood that was shed on the cross to cover our sin, you know, it's kind of, we can kind of see that as David says, purge me with hyssop and I will be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. You know, is there anything that can be whiter than snow? You know, you know, you know when you're shoveling snow around, it's so pretty and white, and as soon as it starts to mix in with a little bit of dirt or grime or gravel there on the sidewalk, you know, it starts to get a little dirty. But folks, you know, with God, when we ask Him to forgive us of our sins, you know, when you accept the gift of salvation from Jesus, your sins are made whiter. You are made whiter than snow. Your sins are no more. They are gone. And, and I think that's probably why we have such a hard time, you know, with this is, God, how can you forgive me of this? You know, and so when David was asking for God to forgive him, to change him, he was appealing to the character of God. He knew God's character. And he, he knew that uh, if he asked that God would do this. You know, in verse 1, David says, Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. That's unfailing love. That is faithful love. And according to your abundant mercy. See, abundant mercy is enough mercy for any sin. And so David reminded, like God needed reminding of who he was. Hey God, you know, have mercy on me according to your uh, unfailing love and your abundant mercy. David knew God and you need to know God and you need to remember who God is. And if you don't know who God is, get to know who God is. I, I want to share some things with you today about the character of God uh, so that you can have 100% assurance that when you go to Him and you ask for forgiveness of your sins, you know that your sins are forgiven and forgotten. You see, with, is it possible for God to lie? Is it in God's character to lie to us? No, it, it is impossible for God to lie. So in 1 John chapter 1, verses 9 and 10, we read that if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make Him a liar. 
And His Word is not in us. Well, God is not a liar. So you can take that to the bank that, folks, when you ask God for forgiveness, you have it. Uh, you know, David asked God to, to change him, to even give him a new heart. Well, how, how do you get a new heart? We see, with, with God and in Christ, all things are possible. In 2 Corinthians 5.17, it says, If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Amen. Now, even, even your heart can be made new again. It is possible. It can happen with God. Proverbs, and, you know, and the heart is so important, you know, with, with God, with, a, I'm sorry, David known as a man after God's own heart. You see, does God look at the things that we do on the outside? Is He concerned with our burnt offerings, is, is what we mentioned? Is He really concerned with you being in attendance here at church today? Not really, but do you know what he's looking at? He's looking at why are you here today? He's looking at your heart. You know, are you at church today because you want to come and worship a God, you know, to be thankful for the forgiveness in Jesus that he has given to you, that, that, that we live in a country to where we get to know about Jesus. You know, we, there's, there's over 3 billion people in the world right now that have never heard the name of Jesus and more than likely won't hear the name of Jesus. And we are so fortunate to live here, you know, to where we have experienced that. And so we are just so so blessed and uh, and this is why God has been so good to us God knows our heart and, and you know and oftentimes you know we hear if people bad times come you think well what I'll do I'll go to church but is the, is the act of physically being present in this building going to change your life no, do not fool yourself just to think that if you read a few verses in the Bible or you just come to church, that that's going to make things okay with God. See, that's part, honestly, that, that's more secret sin is what that is. That's not being honest with yourself. You see, even, even in, uh, <laughs> in Psalm 51, it says here that, that God knows us. That he knows us and he, he wants us to be honest and to be truthful. Let me see here. Um, behold, verse 6, Behold, you delight in truth in the inward being. God delights when we are truthful with ourselves and with Him on the inside. On the inside where? In the heart. See, Christianity is a heart religion. God looks at the heart. And when the heart is right, it is good and it is right to come to church to worship Him. It is good and it is right to be in His Word as we get instruction from Him. It is good and it is right as we you know, present our offerings. You know, we don't have burnt offerings that we present to the Lord, but you know, in our tithes and offerings, in our financial support of the church, uh, in our time that we give to the church to serve one another, in the time that we invest in one another in community, you know, that all comes from the heart. You know, when the heart is in the right place, all the, you know, the burnt offerings are acceptable before God at that time. But just going through the physical act of a burnt offering in the times of the Old Testament was meaningless, absolutely meaningless before the Lord unless the heart was right. Unless the heart was right. So make sure that your heart is in the right spot. Other things about the character of God. You say, well, I don't know. You know, I've done this, or I've done that. You know, God can never forgive me. Remember that God is entirely good. You know, these are such good things. And folks, take this to heart. Know this for sure. God is completely holy. God is light. 
And in Him, there is no darkness whatsoever. You know, God exists in a state of moral perfection. You know, and when we come to Him and He has given us His Word and He says, you know, if you confess your sins that you will be forgiven, you can take that to the bank. God is faithful to forgive. So, as we wrap up, you know, just, just take a minute and just think about David. He was a man after God's own heart. And yes, he's still known as a man after God's own heart, even though he's committed murder. He has committed adultery. Consider other champions of the Bible. You know, Moses, was he, a, was he perfect? What else did Moses do? It's a murderer. You know, remember, Moses was one of two men that appeared uh, with Jesus when Jesus was transfigured before his disciples. Pretty significant. But Moses' heart was right. Uh, you know, we think about, uh, you know, Saul, later known as Paul. In the, in the New Testament, a, a persecutor of Christians and saw to the death of, of many Christians. Yet, you know, if it weren't for the faithfulness and the life of Paul, uh, the church would not have spread as quickly as it did. And you see, the same love, grace, and mercy that was extended to David, to Moses, to Paul is available to you today the same. And it's the same love and grace and mercy that millions have experienced, billions over the course of time. And so, uh, if today, if, if you feel like you have heard the words that Nathan said to David, you are the man, then it's time for you to do something about that. You know, are you going to deal with that truthfully in the inward being? and confess your sins and to turn to God or to continue with secret sin. Uh, but I know this. If you turn to God, He will be faithful to forgive you. 100% assurance with that. So Cody's going to come and, and uh, have a song for us at this time. And so we'll have a moment of invitation. And if you have something you need to pray about, then we ask you to, to come forward and my, myself or Andy or Jeremy, Neil, anybody will, will be glad to, uh, to pray with you at that time.